eight streams of influence. I knew he would do this again. I knew it. Well, it's magic. <laughs> it's your fault, Ed. I, hey, I've had to help interviewers finish their program. Right. Okay. Yeah, I know. And I'm Me with too. you. I just sit there and I say, jump in and the flow. Ed, yeah. Ed, Ed's flow will take you wherever you want to go. <laughs> and and you, you. Do it, you do it so well. But leadership, everything rises and falls on leadership. So in every community, in every country, there are eight streams of influence. We, we, this is just well documented. We've got it down. Government, business, education, media, arts, family, uh, religion, and, 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 and uh, health. Okay. okay. Now, these are the eight streams of influence. We only go into the country when we get permission from the top of those people. And, and here's what's key. So the president says, we want you to come in. We say, well, to the president, will you and your cabinet go through transformation tables? Uh, you know, this, when the Supreme Court justice, I said, now, will you and your Supreme, will you, will you start a transformation table? Mm-hmm. And, and we go right to the top. And, and, and if they won't, we vet countries and we don't go because, because they won't. Here's what we found. I have, I have seven companies, but one of my companies is, is a, is a um, leadership training company. And, and, and what, here's what we discovered. This is huge. The major difference between success and failure in a company when we're doing leadership training with them, there, there's one indicator, and we can tell it on day one whether they're going to make it or not. There's one indicator of whether it's going to be successful or not, and here it is. When the leaders buy into the program and they go to the program themselves, mm-hmm. it's going to be successful. Interesting. If they have the program, pay all the money and resources, and send their people, it's not going to go. Mm. people do what people see. Mm. And so the buy-in is the fact that in those eight streams, at the very top, they say yes, and they get involved. Now, what does influence do? Influence just filters down Got it. through the whole country Got it. and through the whole culture. Very good. And so what? So what? no matter what stream your listeners are with me on right today, no matter what stream they're in, this really works. And, and I'm going to give you one example I could give you a hundred, but I will give you one. It, the, the, in, in Guatemala, we've been doing transformation tables, teaching values to the second largest bank in the country. It has 10,000 employees. Okay. So it's a big bank. Mm-hmm. So the CEO, after they've done this for two years, the CEO uh, asked me to come down he said, I have 2000 of our clients that I'm bringing together. And I want you to talk to them about change your world and transformation tables and values. Because he said, it's so changed our company, I want, I want to help our clients. And so I said I would. So he introduces me, 2,000 clients out there. And here's what he says. For two years, we've been doing transformation tables in our business. Three positive outcomes. Number one, our bottom line, the profit, better than it's ever been by four. In fact, he said it increased 36% last year. Mm. Now, wh- why did the bottom line do so well? We teach values, yeah. hard work, industry, honesty, integrity, teamwork. Yep. His employees are, are, are learning all these values, and all of a sudden, they start to, to live them and embrace them. Now, bottom line profit, number one. Number two, he said, we now have a leadership culture in our company. He said, we there didn't have a leadership go. culture here. There you go. He said, and, and where did they get their leaders? In the tables. Yeah. Because, Ed, if you are not at a table... One week, you'll you'll facilitate that table, and you'll take whatever value that comes up. Next mm-hmm. week, the person beside you facilitates it, and we go we 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 pass the leadership baton around. And and how do you develop leaders by practicing leaders? How do you know you have leaders by watching them practice? Very good. And he said, all Very of a sudden, good. leaders are popping up. He said, we have more leaders now than we have positions for them. Now that's Very a pleasant good. thing to have. No. Nope. Number three, and this is the one that really got me. So good. He said, the families of our employees have beautifully changed. Hmm. What are they doing? They're taking those values they've learned at work. And by the way, every week, 45 minutes, they, the banks all shut down. We do the tables on, on, on bank time. Hey, they go home to their families, say, here's what we're discussing this week. It bleeds right into the families. And all of a sudden, the family gets better. It's so good. That's why I love what this work. This is, okay, I wrote a book, but I, I, I'm wanting to create a movement. Yeah. And that's what I'm passionate about. It's it's and, and movements don't start with the mass; they start with them few, 
you know, mass movements never start with a mask. When Gandhi left prison and started going to the, by the time he got to the sea, he had a million, but he only had six with him in the beginning. So Crazy. let's, let's, hey, he just had one transformation table in the beginning. Yeah. And by the time he got there, he had a million. And, and we think we have the possibility through this book to, to start a positive movement of, of values, learning, living, and embracing. And, and, and that's going to be fun. And the way that you do it, John, is worth, see, I think watching what John's doing, not only in the content, but the way in which he's creating the movement. So for me, I, I don't always just watch the execution. I also watch the the ex, the person executing. I shouldn't say executioner, but the person doing the executing. <laughs> and one of the things you talk about in the book, and I want people to go read the book, so we'll only cover one or two more things in it. But the truth is, you talk about moving from me to we. Yeah. And it's, I think so many leaders unknowingly still sort of make what's happening about them. And they're not mm -hmm. cognizant enough of making it about the we. And I don't think any great movement has ever happened without a cause. And I don't know that enough business leaders are aware of turning their business into a cause. And for me, I've done that in business. But when I read the book, I'm like, if I'd done that in my family, I'm the leader of my family. What's the cause of our family? What's our family's mission? That's why what you just said about the cruise really made an impact on me. So can you just speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I'd be glad to, because I, I think that we, you know, Stephen Covey said, begin with the end in mind. And, 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 and when I wrote Intentional Living, it was whole, the whole deal is most people accept their life instead of lead their life. Yeah. And, and so when we talk about this movement and what we're trying to create, first of all, it starts with credibility. Uh, a cause without credibility won't go anywhere. I, I know a lot of people, they have really good values and a really good cause, but they're not credible. They can't say, but we've done it. And, 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 and you know, if I haven't done it, all I can do is tell. Yeah. But when I've done it, I can show and tell. Oof. And show and tell is about 100 to 1 more powerful than just tell. And, and, and so, you know, when, when a lot of times books are tell, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I loved what you said about your imagination a while ago. And I think so many people cut themselves short because they don't allow their imagination to take them to where their potential could be. But, but what I do know is this, that in the cause, the cause has to be a positive cause that adds value to people. Let me just say, you can't sustain a movement out of negativity. We've got a lot of negativity in our country right now. No you can't sustain negativity. It, 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 people wear out so with, true. there's only so, I, there's only much, I could only curse the darkness so long. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it, it, until, okay, now I've cursed the darkness and it's really dark and we've cursed a lot and it's, nothing's happened. Yeah. Hey, hey, this book is uh, quit cursing the darkness and go turn on the light. Oh, gosh, this is a turn so on good. the light book. This is a turn on the light movement. In other words, you've got to be for something. The moment that you're for something, that, catch this, adds value to the people. Mm. This is not a movement that adds value to me. You, when you talked about me to we a moment ago, Ed, you're so right on, my friend. You're so right on. The vision never is sustaining if it's about me. I mean, if I'm saying, hey, Ed, join my team. Hey, come on into my, hey, get into my coaching company. Hey, get, you know, get on my leadership train. Well, how many mys do you need to hear before you sit there and say, boy, you know, I think, I, I think I'm John's slave here. I, I, I think, you know, no, 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 no. It's, the first thing that has to happen is that you've got to take the vision from me to we. Ed, the vision works when all of a sudden you're not talking about John Maxwell's book. Mm -hmm. you, when you go to your friends, you say, let me tell you something. This book helped me. Now, it's contagious. It now has legs. It's, it's not like, well, John has a book out here. No, no. They don't care about John Maxwell. They care about the fact that it's helped you. Now mm. that it's helped you, you it, there's a difference between being a vision caster and being a vision carrier. <laughs> What's Casting the difference? vision, you can just cast, you know, oh, well, this is good. Old. Throw that out. Cast that out. You know, here we go. The moment you're a carrier, you cast the vision by because of who you are. You're so stinking contagious that everybody catches it they catch it because you won't let them not catch it you won't shut up about it you be and why it because it's you it's changed you and all of a sudden it's made a difference in ed's life mm. not maxwell's life it's not about me it's all about you and when you go to your group you know 
Friday night and you go bring that book and you start sharing what it's helping you do. Can I tell all of a sudden they're, they're in the game. They're in the game. Hmm. Okay. I, I'm, I gotta, sorry. I'm, li I'm listening to you. I'm just thinking, you know, you're such a treasure. I, I don't, I, you know, and I don't mean to just, I'm just speaking what I feel when I talk with you. And I'm curious, John, like, so, by the way, what you just said, I have to just add one thing to it. I recently interviewed Martin Luther King III, and uh, we were talking, obviously, a lot about, does dad create just this little movement, you know? Uh, yeah. Only one of the greatest movements in the last 100 years, probably oh. arguably the greatest movement in the last 100 years. Oh, yeah. And um, I was golfing this week with a buddy of mine, and he goes, that guy was, uh, Martin Luther King was awesome. He was against racism. I said, that's not right. He was for equality. He was for justice. He was for unity. You don't create a movement that lasts this long being against something. There's nothing wrong with having an adversary that you're against. But Jesus Christ's great movement wasn't just against the adversary. It was for our salvation, if you're a person of faith. That's what endures. And so I just want to second that. But when I look at you, we are going to talk about John Maxwell for a second. I'm listening to this man who's been at this for more than one decade, put it, put it mildly. And I'm watching him at the top of his game. I've known him a while. I've read, I haven't read every one of the 86 books, but I've read a lot of them. I, way before we met, you all heard me singing the praises of John Maxwell. And I'm watching him. I'm like, he's better than he's ever been. I believe of all the things, ownership, uh, patience, I believe the biggest thing that has contributed to my realization of my dream has been my environment. I mean, think about it. If I had not joined John's team, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be hokey right here. If I had not joined John's team 23 years ago, about 10, 12 years ago, I wouldn't have got a chance to meet you. We wouldn't have got a chance to be guides together in Maxwell's growth environment, the app. We wouldn't have got to share stages like we will on March the 13th. I have constantly been exposed to greater thinking, greater possibility, and greater people because of the environment that I've put myself in. Same. And I think of that, I think so many times people look at somebody on a podcast or on a stage or in a leadership position and they think they don't understand the steps that they got there. Truly, for you and I, it's, it's just a matter of taking learning steps to regular people who just leaned in ferociously for growth. You know, John says, those who start with you won't necessarily end with you. And, and sometimes that's letting go of people who are dream busters because you're moving forward and they just want to tear away your dreams because they're working through their own stuff for whatever reasons. But sometimes that means they just stopped growing and learning. And for me, I never wanted to be somebody who was less behind. I wanted to be somebody who was growing right along, trying to keep up with the people who were growing and leading me towards more growth. And that's somebody... You're, you're someone who's that person for me, Mark. I mean, I see you growing and I don't want to be left behind. I want to be hanging on to your tails as you're hanging on to John's tails as we are learning and being pulled into that next level of growth. Let, let me say this, Tracy, uh, not to interrupt you, but let, let me say this no, on that please. point. Again, I, you guys know my story. I've told you in podcast land, I run multi-million dollar companies. Um, Tracy does as well. We've got teams of, of thousands that are depending on us to make good leadership decisions every single day. You know where I'm going to be on growth day? I'm going to be up front right beside you, Tracy, with a pen and a pad and learning because the most important thing I can do that day is the most important thing I can do today. And that is grow myself to be prepared for tomorrow's opportunities and tomorrow's challenges. And so you never get too old. You never get too advanced. You never have a promotion that then disqualifies you from needing to focus on personal growth. And, and so that's a, that's a winner's mindset. Yesterday's victory is tomorrow's challenge if you don't set out to make a victory again. I'm One final little thing. I'm a big Georgia Bulldog fan. Go dogs. We just won the national championship again. I could not go another podcast without congratulating myself as a, the best Georgia fan ever. <laughs> However, let me tell you this job right here. to win, Mark. You did I'm a great sorry. Job. I'm sorry. Forgive my lack of humility here, but let me, <laughs> let me do say this. What has happened at Georgia is what ha needs to happen in your life. You need to create a winning environment that will challenge you to go out every single time with a commitment to win. And again, that starts with the environment. That's right. 12 choices leaders 
make to fuel their influence. Talk about increasing their influence. We're going to give you some things that you make choices, maybe even on a daily basis, and you're not even aware of it, that will increase or fuel your influence. And we talk about that leadership is influence. We interchange the words all the time uh, here at Maxwell Leadership. And so what we want to do is generate some, some thoughts, some discussion around how do you grow this? What does it look like with some of these simple terms? Yeah. And you created a chart, yeah. which will be, well, you can download it in the learner's guide. Yep. And we're going to kind of go through this and banter them back and forth. I think that would be a good way to do it. And it, uh, you use the word simple. It is a simple, uh, these are not rocket science, but they are. It's so amazing to me when I get into discussions with people. Actually, we'll tell people, uh, we've said it here many, many times, said that people are watching you all the time. And people always agree, 100%, they agree. And then I'll say, but what are they watching for? Now, do you remember the answer to that? Um, what are they watching for? I, where I'm going to lunch? <laughs> yeah, they, no. Uh, no. I, you know, I think about your, how you're leading your actions, how you're reacting. Reaction, that's another. Oh, that's oh huge. Oh, man, yeah. we could talk about that for a while yeah. as a leader. Uh, how you're interacting, what your behavior is. Really, when it comes down to I tell a lot of people, we're really in the behavioral change business. Yeah. Not only we start with ourselves first, continuing to work on our own behaviors, but then helping leaders and cultures develop you know, their leaders. It also goes back to the definition that we get from kind of Greg Cagle with the culture piece, which is how are you thinking, acting, and interacting mm, good, yeah. as a leader? And so that's what they're watching for. That's it. I love that. Uh, although I do, when I ask that in, a, um, in large meetings, always someone says they're watching for you to mess up. <laughs> okay, no. Uh, there may be that odd individual that yeah. would like for you to mess up, but for the most part, People don't want you as their leader to mess up. They want you to succeed because when you succeed, they succeed. So I think they're watching you for your, your actions, your reactions, your interactions, and your behaviors. And why are they watching for this? What are they doing with that information? Yeah, remember, you. in order to increase your influence with people, you don't get to determine what level of influence you have with them. They get to determine. So you don't walk into a room and say, I'm... I have level four influence with Perry Holly. <laughs> that, that's not how it works. How it works is that Perry would say, hey, Chris has level four influence with me. Right. And so when you think about it that way, what they're watching for is really as a leader is how, how do we get from level one influence as a titled leader to them to level two where they're giving you permission? Well, they're not going to give you permission to lead them or influence them until they watch your behaviors before yeah. they watch your actions. Yeah, so I wanna, I'm trying to determine. I'm not going to let you lead me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So these 12 things, Let's do it. they're simple. Maybe we should do a little point counterpoint. Yeah. Uh, which I'm going to give you the easy side. You can take the what I think helps your influence. I did notice it was the easier side, so yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, I give you the, the uh, helps influence, and I'll take the could hurt your influence. Okay. Um, so why don't you go first? Yeah, what, the first thing we have here is what could a actually help your influence is we have the word ask. and Versus oh, tell. Tell. Okay. Right? So yeah. ask for us would be. Are you really curious, increasing your influence? You've got to ask questions. Good leaders, right, ask great questions. And you have to do that in order to be curious. When you're curious and you're asking people questions and you want to know their point of view, then it's going to increase your influence. It's going to help you. Yeah. And then if I take the tell side of that, <laughs> is I, I'm going to tell people what to do. I'm going to, I'm kind of leaning on that level one influence yeah. again. I'm not, uh, I'm like, I'm the smartest one in the room. Like I have all the answers. Uh, so I like what about like influence building with ask says that you're involving me in the decision. Tell says it's all about me. Uh, and it becomes almost like a dictator. And it really causes people, we mentioned in a previous podcast about salute and stay mute, just do what you're told, yeah. which then reduces engagement. It's, it's not a winning formula. Right. So I definitely want to be on the ass side. Yeah, I love that. Second one we have for you is focus versus distracted. Yes. And for me, when I think about how you increase your influence, when I, we use the word focus, it's really about do your people feel like when you're having a conversation with them or you're in a meeting with them, that this is the most important thing that you could be working on or talking about at that moment, no matter what it is. Or are you distracted like you talked about? And so in order to increase your influence, you need to be focused on your, the team, the individuals, the conversation, the meeting, the people. I'll never forget, I was visiting a client of ours, and this individual that was in this, in this organization, I would have purely, I would have level one influence with him. He has level one influence with me. We don't really know each other that well. We know our titles in the different organizations. And I'll never forget, I walked into his office really for maybe the first or second time that we met, he was working on his laptop and 
he he saw me walk in. He shut his laptop, stood up, shook my hand, and then we had a 25 minute conversation. Like I was the most important thing, and I thought left there. I goes, man, like I absolutely your influence has grown with me because of the way that you interacted and focused on yeah me. versus being distracted if he'd have left yeah. his laptop open his yeah. phone's on the desk he's looking around checking on uh, text messages reading stuff while he's appearing to try and talk to you are you influenced by that do you are you willing to give that person influence in, to over you to, that you're going to willingly uh, participate with them i don't think so it, it really speaks distraction speaks that you don't value me and so when you're focused and pay attention and Love you're it. present, you value people yeah, to do that. that. Well, the third one, I'm going to let you go first here because I, 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 I don't yeah, struggle yeah. with this a little bit. Like I'm, and so I want you to talk and, about and it, the negative side of this. Yeah, okay? so it was neat versus messy. <laughs> uh, this, I, I probably could have used different words. I, but, oh, I like uh, it. We're keeping like it simple. It. Yeah, but i thinking if, if uh, you walk in my office and I'm completely disorganized, uh, uh, it kind of leads into unprepared. I don't know where my things are. I'm, I'm searching for things. I, I, I'm uh, disheveled, disarray. It could even carry over into my dress and how I appear uh, to people that I'm, that I'm not put together. I'm, it, it really breeds some uh, some concern with people that you you don't have it all together. Yeah. Now, is this saying you can't you have if you have a messy office? You can't be an effective leader. No, I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying it just if you're trying to gain influence with people, I'm more influenced by people who are organized and put together. So uh, are you a neat freak? No, I'm not. And that's why I was like, I'm to, I want to hear your side of the story first. But I think it's interesting about this, what I was thinking about, is that we talk about increasing your influence. And so in this example that I'm going to give you, it's really about increasing your influence from level two to level three. Hmm. So to your point, Let's say I'm working for a leader and, and I and and he has level or she has level two influence with me. And I go into his or her office and it's a complete disaster. And I start thinking about, man, do do we really know what our KPIs are? Do we really know where the next project is? Whatever. And I go, hmm, I don't know. Now, some people that might not bother. And so you just got to begin thinking about that. And so I do think also under the neat side that people do try to model um leadership in certain ways and your people will follow at, at sometimes and i think this is a great way to be able yeah. to do that number four um we have talk versus yell <laughs> i think this was so obvious <laughs> yeah this is right the where i here's what i thought when i said this to increase your influence is that um people care more about hearing your voice than it is what you're saying at times mm -hmm. and this really goes back to communication as a leadership competency that is a there's a deficit of this in any organization right. around the world and and so they do care about that now they they may not necessarily care exactly what you're saying but they want to hear the leader's voice and the more they hear your voice i think that'll increase your influence versus yeah yelling or raising your oh, voice man. or losing your temper having emotion around this i'm thinking about what we talked earlier what are people watching for your actions that's obviously how about your reactions how do you how do you handle bad news? How do you handle difficult information? And if you go into um, to anger or emotional uh, spraying on people, your emotions, and raising your voice and that sort of thing, uh, it, it's an instant turnoff for most people when it comes to influencing me. I'm going to back away, pull back on that. I'm much more influenced by a consistent behavior of you you're yeah. you're managed when it's good you're managed when it's bad you talk at a you it's a respect it's a it's a, a advent of respect toward people is i don't yell at people yeah that's 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 disrespectful and so it, it may seem like a small one but it, it it's probably more obvious than some of the others but it well and i deal. think in the heat of the moment and when when your back's up against the wall some leaders don't understand that good and uh, i would encourage you to dig into that a little bit well the fifth one that we're going to bring to you today is you help your influence by what we call kind of measured or measuring uh, versus maybe being rushed or yeah. reactive in, in a way. And I'll let you speak to that in just a minute. For me, when I think about the word measured or measuring, it comes with thought. It, it The leader has thought through. It's a measured approach. The other thing I took it was also measuring results or measuring what the team is doing or where you're going or what you're leading um and you know what you measure gets done and everybody wants to be a part of a winning team mm -hmm. right uh, versus a losing team and so the only way to really know if you're winning versus losing and how to correct and what not to correct is to measure what you're doing 
Yeah, I think uh, what I was going with measured versus rushed is that are, are, the, are you, and you said it was thoughtful, are, are you uh, more precise, mm. are you rushed, are you, are you just going from thing to thing to thing? Uh, is it um, too much for people to keep up? They, it, you're, you don't have a measured approach to things, so you're uh, if, you're making me feel almost disheveled again and out of out of sorts. And you're in such a hurry with things that you don't. John would say, "Stop and walk among the, the mm, crowd, yeah. be, be among the people." That you're always rush, rush, rush to do things that is is problematic. I love it. All right, the next one we're going to talk about number six on the chart is on time versus late. For me, this is really about respecting other people. Uh, and I need to get better at this. I think even the way we calendar things uh, could help you become more on time, just so that you're showing respect and engagement level with other team members. Yeah, and that, I think it speaks for itself. that If you're late, you're, yeah. you're disrespecting, you're not being there. Next one says margin versus maxed out. Yeah. Uh, we, we, why are we laughing? Because this is our life. Uh, that we're, yeah. This is actually something we battle with right now. We do. Yeah. And, and several, if you haven't listened to an episode we did several weeks ago around the new kind of hot buzz around quiet quitting, mm -hmm. I would encourage you to do that. We talked a little bit about this, and there is – is that we've got to do a better job as leaders of modeling margin in our own life and then also talking about and yeah. and encouraging your team to have margin in their life and when you do that I, I think it increases your influence yeah when you're maxed out you're you're just sending a bad message people don't i i don't even want to approach my leader because i don't want to add something else they seem like they're stressed out they're going to fall apart they're 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 over the top they're consumed completely yeah, I'll just keep it to myself. Yeah. Now my level of engagement. Um, number eight is respond versus react. And this, for me, when you talk about, sometimes when people will engage you, voicemail, text, email, this is where I went with this personally, and I don't respond, which happens, um, <laughs> then that is nothing favorable with your influence. But when you do respond in a way that it just, it's consistent and it increases your influence, I Actually, just this morning, before we recorded this episode, there was an email where a team member of mine sent that added value to me in some research that I was doing, and I had not responded to it. Didn't even you know acknowledge it, but I was grateful for it, and I thought, man, I need to I need to respond. And so I just responded and said, thank you. This helped me a ton. That's all it takes. Yeah. But the fact that when and think about what that feels like for us when you know we add value to people, we're doing something, we get no response. We're just like, yeah, mm -mm, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think about this also from a different approach on that, about React. Again, it's, uh, I call it mind the gap between what happened, what someone said. If I go quickly, as there's no gap, then I have a reaction that's usually not that good. Yeah. But if I can pause for a moment and have a gap there, I can respond in a more Love thoughtful it. way. Uh, but I actually like what you took it, too, is that there's really a lot of influence building in being responsive to yeah. people. That's a, maybe you can add that to the list. Yeah. Uh, the next one, number nine, says consistent mm -hmm. versus erratic. Uh, boy, that's a um, big one. It kind of goes back to some of the ones we talked about. It kind of relates back to are you, when, when you're triggered, when things go south, when there's tension in the air, um, a challenge, are, are, you, are you all over the place? Or does your emotion and, and your behavior uh, have a consistency to it? Yeah, and I think this, for me, when you increase your influence through consistency, it's really, it really comes down to the word approachable. And I think when you are approachable, no matter what is going on around you, that increases your influence. I agree. Number 10, the, uh, the difference here is listener versus talker. And, and for me, you know, our team, our people want to be heard, period. Now, we're not saying hear them. We're saying listen to them. <laughs> I say that because I maybe have that being told to me at home sometimes. <laughs> uh, and so I think the better listener, we all can become better listeners. And I think the better listener we become, the more we'll increase our influence. Yeah, the, you, oh, you talk too much. You don't trust people that talk all the yeah. time. It, it, you, too many well, words. Again, it goes back to being measured about what are you talking? Are you listening? Are you listening more than you talk? Uh, people, they're, be, they're influenced by uh, people that ask good questions and then listen to the answer. You don't have to be always talking over people to or, do that. Or whatever they're talking about you got a better story and yeah. you're one up in my story and, yeah yeah all that stuff yeah. like no yeah don't do that uh, go, uh number 11 uh i threw this in because <laughs> are can you have a sense of humor or are you always serious humor yeah. versus serious i've worked for a lot of leaders <laughs> and i've had some serious right but 
they had great influence with me. But there's just a different level of influence and connection for me personally. Maybe not everybody listening to where when there's humor. And I just think it drives for me. It drives realness. It drives engagement. And, and then in turn increases your influence. And I love it because we, we do laugh a lot here. Uh, we, we, um, we take the work seriously, but we don't take ourselves seriously. And we, yeah. we uh, take shots at each other and we laugh at each other. Even here in the studio today, yeah. we've, had, I mean, we've laughed pretty hard with We're Jake. We're an hour and, and a half late because Jake kept yeah, throwing yeah, daggers at yeah, us. Yes, yeah, but we laughed. No, we, we laughed. We had a good yeah. time. All right, number 12, uh, one of my favorites yeah. is, are you teachable or are you the know-it-all? <laughs> and I just find that. It's one of my favorite words in leadership is that are you showing yourself teachable and or do you the, the leader that comes in and you have all the answers you never ask any questions you tell people all the things um, and it just doesn't bode well for influence when you have all the answers home as a leader I never forget this illustration and I'm not sure who I heard it from first where you want to be that leader that individual to where uh, when you walk in a room and then you you leave the room the room feels smarter than it did maybe mm -hmm. before you had that conversation what you don't want in a leader or you don't want to represent yourself and won't increase your influence is if you walk into a room and they go well man he obviously thinks he was the smartest person in the room remember i, I said thanks because you i guarantee you were not you never are <laughs> well, but that you. just has that it just has that aura when when it's not it's not good when you walk in as if you know it all and you're the subject matter expert you may be you may be but, man, you do not need to do that. You need to go in there with a teachable heart. And I think if you do that, it increases your influence. If you want to set high expectations, you need to lead by example. Leaders, leaders go you first. At that? Yeah, leaders. Are you feeling? No. You, you need to confess? No. We're no. all listening. Yes. No. I, the whole team is listening. Okay. Uh, no, listen, leaders go first. We, we talk about this, Perry and I. You know, it is a visual sport. Mm -hmm. We both like sports. And so we try to tie a lot of. Uh, leadership principles and, and, and sports stories. People do what people see. They are watching you hmm. all, the time. Says, all the time. All the time. Yeah. Um, and so we would need to make sure that we are modeling that behavior, that work ethic that um, we are going to expect from our team because if they see it, it's going to become contagious. And so if you want your team to work hard and you want them to be committed to the goal, Let's make sure you are as well, because they're going to follow in those footsteps. And you are a good example, except for how you do email. But, uh, yeah, we're uh, working on that. You're, we're, but, but, uh, you know. Hey, you know what they say, right? Lead where you're strong. Team or put a system around where you're weak. Yes. I'm working on putting a yes. system around you where you're weak. You are doing much better. I've seen some uh, real improvement lately. I got a return to email. <laughs> <laughs> it was 30 days later, but it did come. I, but it did come. Yeah, so, that's right. Pretty excited. You know, I heard John ask a question, to, back to what you're saying about leading by example, but he said... If everyone on the team produced at your level mm -hmm. and what you're doing, if they mirrored That's you, good. would that be a good thing or a bad thing? Right. And I said, that's right. where you that's are great. a good example. Your productivity, your work ethic, your leading from the front, you being out there does set a good example. We would not be working as – nobody wants to work as hard as they do and look over at you're not doing right. it. So uh, I love that. Uh, I appreciate that's that. That's a good thing. Uh, third was if you want to set a high expectation, uh, you're going to need to provide the resources and support that people uh, need on the team. Uh, do they have, you know, ask them, do people have what they need uh, and the support to meet the expectations you're set? Uh, if you're calling people to a higher level, to more productivity, um, you know, I'm thinking things like training, coaching, access to tools, resources, things that may be there. Uh, man, there's nothing worse than uh, having a leader set high expectations than leave you on your own to figure it out. So I, li I like that idea of, as a leader, I do have a high expectation of you, but I'm checking in. I'm, do you have what you need? Are you spinning Love your that. tires? Where are you having a problem? Why are you not uh, picking up the pace? And you're thinking, well, we got this new report, and it, we don't. We have to do it by hand, and we don't have any. Okay, I can help with that. I thought yeah. if I don't check in and know where you are, I, I don't know how to help you to do yeah. that. You, as a leader, your responsibility, and this is what you're saying, is to remove barriers for them hmm. in the way of achieving their expectation, their KPIs and that that you should be asking those questions and I love that and I think that right there if you're not taking notes or you didn't download the learner guide I want to encourage you that that right there is a, a gold if you had a team and you set high expectations which I love that then you better be in it with them mm -hmm. sometimes rolling up your sleeves but most of the time saying to your point what do you need what's in your way what's not working how can I 
And, and as a leader, that should be your responsibility as you set those high expectations. Fourth, setting high expectations is to encourage feedback. Mm -hmm. um, while we're setting these high expectations, it won't be worth much if the team can't meet them. <laughs> if you can't just, you know, like what a lot of people say out there, especially in the sales world, it just, uh, you know, they, they're putting a number out there mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, well, that's not going to work, right? <laughs> it's uh, just a, a wild <clears throat> guess on uh, some what they're going to be able to accomplish. And so, you know, for this reason, <laughs> we need to make sure that they're realistic. You can have some stretch goals, but let's make sure that we feel like we can attain or work towards those high expectations. And then we need to create an environment for this feedback. I would say continual feedback. You know, we talk a lot about this and we have different parts of our business content, which you're, you head up for us. We got account management and deliverables. We got sales, we got speaking, we got all kinds of different parts, consulting and coaching. And so we've got to be able to be comfortable receiving feedback from our team. Hey, I know this is the expectation of me as a team member. However, let me just, can I give you some feedback on why I think this is going to work? Why it's not going to work? Why I think we can stretch that a little bit and be open to being able to have that dialogue. And so there's a lot of leaders out there who don't encourage feedback. No. Um, they they, they want to give feedback, but they don't necessarily encourage it either. You know, the, the communication pathways of going both ways. So how does, and, and I know you work a lot with this in mm -hmm. the one-on-one -on -one coaching that we do with yeah. leaders around the world. How do we go about helping leaders create an environment of feedback. How have you coached through that? I, know, I asked a guy the other day, I said, are you providing feedback? Oh, yeah, I love telling people all the good things they're doing. <laughs> I said, okay, that's encouragement. That's not uh, – feedback is two-way. Two, two way. Yeah. There can be some encouragement for sure, but there's got to be some constructive in there. And so I like having the feedback conversation, not the feedback sandwich. The feedback conversation yeah. says, here's something I thought you were doing well. Here's an area I thought you could improve. What do you think? We're looking every day now on Minute with Maxwell at the 16 laws of communication. This is law number 10, the law of simplicity, which basically says communicators take something complicated and make it simple. I often tell people, although I have an education, I'm a communicator, not an educator. What do I mean by that? Educators take something simple, make it complicated. <laughs> they just do. They, If you can understand it, they're not too happy about it. And communicators take something complicated and make it simple. And when I teach, I try to do what I say. When I use the phrase, I try to put the cookies on the lower shelf so that everybody can reach them, everybody can touch them, and everybody can obviously eat them. So in the law of simplicity, I basically talk about keep your lesson, keep your message simple. I say things like, get to the point before people start asking, What's the point? Wow. I talk about repetition. Say it again and again and again and again. I talk about the fact that if you can't explain it simply, you probably don't understand it. I was being interviewed, and um, the person that was interviewing me, I, I, he, I was talking about one of my new books that had been released, and I kind of had the feeling that that he really didn't care for me too much. Uh, but one of the things he said in the interview was he said, John, he said, I've read your books and and they're very simple. And I said, well, yeah, they are. And he said, why are your books so simple? I said, well, I, I just want people to understand them and apply them to their life. And as he kept pressing me on simplicity, I finally said, well, you know, my books are simple as far as to understand but it takes effort and energy and action to apply those laws. And that's exactly what happens. When I get up to speak, I ask myself two questions. What do I want the people to know? What do I want the people to do? Those two questions. What I want them to know is all about simplicity and explaining and teaching things. What do I want them to do? I want them to know and understand the content in such a way that they can go out and they can apply it to their life. Less is more. That's the law of simplicity. Well, we're looking at the 16 laws of communication. Law number 13 is the law of the thermostat. Basically, that law says communicators read the room and then they change the 
temperature. Once in a while, I'll hear somebody that is a communicator and they'll say, wow, that was a tough audience. I want to say to them, the audience shouldn't control the communicator. The communicator should control the audience. We have the ability to look around the room and, if needed, turn the temperature up. However, let me just tell you a personal story quickly where <sighs> I wasn't able to turn the thermostat up at all. I was in Nairobi, Kenya, and I was getting ready to do a large leadership conference, and it was to be held at a hotel, and all of a sudden they realized that the registrations exceeded the uh, maximum people that they could put in the room, and so at the literally last minute, they decided to have me teach in the massive lobby of the hotel. Oh, my. One look at the lobby, and I knew I was in trouble. There were six big pillars in the lobby. There were four elevators going up and down. People were coming in. People were going out. Baggage was being transferred continually. Announcements were being made over the system. People were mingling. Some of them were sitting, reading. Some of them were watching television. And I have to communicate to about 2,500 people in this room. I knew I was in trouble. And in fact, I couldn't even see all the people. The pillars were in the way. They couldn't see me. I'll have to say that it was kind of a low time in my communication life. But let me tell you about one person who read the room and turned up the thermostat. He's my good friend, Tom Mullins. He was with me on this trip, and he immediately saw I was in trouble. The lobby was not at all conducive for any type of good communication. It's my turn to speak. I'm not wanting to speak. I'm not in the mood. But I get up to speak, and Tom picks up his chair and moves it to about six feet right in front of me, sits the chair down, gets out his pen, gets out his paper, looks up at me and says, John, just teach me tonight. I can hardly wait to learn. I can hardly wait to hear. Give it to me, John. Give it to me. I'm ready. Come on, John. Give it to me. <laughs> I smiled at Tom. Oh, my gosh, that's what a good friend is right there. He read the room. He knew that we were in trouble. And he turned the heat up on the thermostat by becoming a person that would say, I'm going to get in front of John. And if he can only see one person, that person's going to nod, that person's going to encourage, and that person's going to take notes. That night, Tom Mullins read the room and turned the thermostat up. All great communicators do that, but sometimes it's also helpful to have someone in the audience help you out just a little bit. Nine uh, well, acrostic, like yeah. this is a long sermon, Perry. I'm yeah, used no. to three points or five points. That's why it's two lessons. <laughs> yeah, so we broke it up into two. So we're going to talk today about the first four, and then I hope you'll join us for our next session. We'll we'll finish the five that are left there. So why don't you get All us started? Right. And this is not for you to memorize. What does the I stand for? This right. is for us to put in some actionable things we can do. And so I'll uh, I'll present the uh, what the letter and how John set that up, but I'd love for your uh, kind of real world, how do you yeah. see that? But the I in the word influence as we start off is stands for integrity. And it is really how we build relationships on trust. Mm. And you think about um, your match, uh, your walk, uh, matching your talk, and that uh, not only about being honest and uh, having high character, but you think about the word uh, integrated or, or integer. It, you, you are one. Mm. You are um, you, you, how you act, how you think, um, how you talk is all integrated, and it's and people can trust who you are with uh, when it about integrity. Uh, my favorite thought there is about consistency. Uh, you're a known quantity. Mm -hmm. you, you, people know what they can expect when they see you because of the high level of integrity. I love that. Place. Yeah, when you talk about integrity with influence, I, I love the word consistency. It does compound what you do. And so integrity is really the linchpin of all mm -hmm. influence. I think if you don't have integrity, um, man, there's no chance of you increasing your influence, growing your influence, developing others. Your actions as leaders have to uh, line up with your words, and um, you don't want to ever 
if you worked with somebody that uh, you go, hmm, man, I mean, is he <laughs> or she telling me the truth? Like, what are they trying to, you know, what's the the motive here? And yeah. is there deception? Like, you you can't do that. Your words and your actions have to align. And people that you have the privilege of connecting with have to believe that you have high integrity. And you also don't want to mislead people. You don't want to look better than you are. And um, I love the word you talked about. You know, you said trust. And for us, trust is a currency to all influence. And without integrity, there can be no trust. And I know that a lot of us can say, man, I remember working for a leader where, number one, uh, they did just didn't line up yeah. to what you talked about. I didn't trust them. I felt like it was for themselves. And, and I don't think they have integrity. And so one of the things that when we talk about practical application for me in regards to this, and I really, really have to work hard at this, and I've got to get better at this, because as I look at my leadership, I go, okay, what is something that I don't do well that maybe I say I do well that could be affecting my mm -hmm. integrity? That's the approach I took about it. You're going to be shocked when you hear this answer. <laughs> It'd be around communication and commitment and re responding to communication. Hold on. No, I'm no, no, off my yes, chair. stop, stop, stop. You can't. <laughs> Jake, turn his mic off. But one of the things I am trying to work towards, and again, I'm just sharing with you kind of where I'm at right now so that the integrity of my leadership stays intact is man, I got to learn to say no, or I got to learn how to set realistic expectations on the response time. Yeah. I think it does two things. One, I think it helps me um, take pressure off of, man, I know that I told Perry I'd get it to him on Friday afternoon, and here it is Sunday afternoon. I'm just now even looking at it. Like I, That weighs heavy on me because integrity is a big part of it. So how could I have done that differently? I should have probably assessed a little bit different on the front end and said, hey, Perry, you'll have it first thing Monday morning in your inbox, knowing that then that would give me Friday, maybe Saturday night, Sunday as I'm working on it. So the realistic expectations. And then when you know, if you're, if you're a people pleaser or you want to serve people, you're going to have to learn how to say no. And I think there are times mm -hmm. that all of us, we say yes to things that either a, we don't want to do and we're not motivated to do it. So we drag our feet to do it. Um, or we just be, we don't have time to do it. And then we don't do it. And then people are like, well, he or she told me that, but they never followed through. And when they start saying that, I think that's when your integrity becomes in question. Well, I appreciate your candor. It's also a two-way street as you're talking. I'm thinking it has to be at least two times in the last week you have had to ask me twice for something. And I thought, well, I knew I had it, and I knew I couldn't get to it right away. But integrity would have said... I should respond and let you know. So again, setting expectations, not, That's good, yeah. not after the fact that I didn't do it and I'm late or whatever, but th that I'm going to have to just, here's the, here's the straight scoop on that. Here, yeah. I, I got your mail. I understand what you want. I'm going to have to, I'm, I'm booked. I've got this, but I'll have it to you then. And I just, I, my tendency is just the opposite of yours. I'll, I'll just, yeah, I'll get to it when I get to it. And I don't bother telling you. Right. And right. That, that's an integrity would require that's something good. different of me. The in, in the word influence, uh, stands for nurturing, and this is where you care about people as individuals. And definitely, if you want to become a person of influence, you absolutely uh, have to be known as someone who cares for people. Mm -hmm. uh, people are not influenced by people that they don't feel care for them. If you if it's just transactional, you ask me for something, I, there's not a lot there. Uh, I use the word genuinely cares. Yeah, I, I, love I love that because I've I've actually worked for for a, a leader that. I knew that when he started asking me how I was, uh, he wanted something. He didn't really care, but I could. It had a pattern with it that caused me to. Uh, I felt manipulated somehow uh, when he when he began to ask that. And I love this word nurturing because uh, nurturing really takes caring mm -hmm. to the next level. You think oh, I care, but if you nurture someone, you're actually doing more than caring. You're you're actually. Uh, you're helping to grow them, protect them, uh, develop them. You, you're you think about nurturing a plant. I mean, you you feed it, you water it, you weed it, you take care of it at a different level. So uh, we don't often use that word, no, but I, I thought like it, that. I like it a lot. Thinking if you're worried about being a person of influence, do I have integrity? And so you practice the practical things you need to practice as we talk about. But nurturing, am I doing more? Mm. I'm taking caring to the next level. What I love about the word nurturing. Um, 
is that it really encompasses the model that we have built this off of that we talked about. It's it's really the level two, three, and four mm -hmm. of the five levels of leadership, oh, that's good. Yep. which is connecting with people, helping people develop and win, and then developing them. To your point, those those things kind of fit right there. And so as you become aware of that as a leader, you go, okay, so what are the things I can be doing uh, to increase my influence around nurturing? And you mentioned a couple of them. Um, but you really have got to make sure that you you really know them. Like, understand. I was talking to a gentleman this morning who I'm very excited to to get to know and spend more time with, and you you're going to as well. His name is, which you didn't know that, but now that we're communicating here and being transparent, um, <laughs> I'm going ahead and commute right now, letting you know. Um, I'll but let you know, I'll get to that when I can. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, but we were talking, his name is was Andy, and he used to be a, a faculty member at the National War College and oh. served in the Air Force. And, man, extremely sharp. Better get to that one dude, sooner. <laughs> executive. Yeah, he knows people. Yeah, right. You and I both need. That's why we're making it public right here. Like. Okay. <laughs> but it was interesting. He said, when you understand the how, how your team is wired, what their strengths and their weaknesses are, he said, it is a doorway to being able to be empathetic with them. It's a doorway to empathy. Mm. And I thought, wow, that's good. And he goes, well, sure, because, not sure because it's good, meaning, but sure, this is how it works. He, he's like, you understand that not all of us um, are empathetic. And I was like, have you been talking to my wife? Yes, I completely understand <laughs> that not all of us have a lot of empathy. And he goes, well, what I'm finding and discovering is the better we know our team, the more empathetic I can be to them. And so that's part of that whole nurturing process. And I think the other thing is, is are you, are you intentionally looking for opportunities to set them up for success, to develop them, to make sure that their future is in alignment with exactly what um, they want to be doing? I'll give you another. I'll give you another story real quick. One of our team members. Uh, we went through the assessment, the working genius. Mm -hmm. Great conversation. Yes. Getting to know each other. And and, and Pat did a fun, phenomenal job with that assessment. And so our team is going through that. Well, we have a an anomaly in our team, which is in the category of what they call wonder. <laughs> and, and this poor team member, she's on an island when it comes to our team. And so we began to unpack this towards the end of last year. And and I, I, I challenged her. I said, man, like that is a gift that you absolutely can bring to the team that would help us, it would help you, and we need to nurture that. And she's like, well, how are we going to do that? And I said, I'm, I'm going to hold you accountable to once a week, once every other week, I want you to go somewhere. We used to call it white space or yeah, thinking time. Right, right. And I want you to pick a, a question or two. And I just want you to wander on it. Yeah. Like, you know, no pun intended. But And she's like, are you serious? <laughs> oh, my gosh, that's awesome. That would develop that. So that's an example, not, not of my leadership. It's just an example of saying, hey, get intentional about truly understanding the strengths and weaknesses so that you can be empathetic to where they are. Um, and how this led to empathy for me, uh, as I'll wrap up here. Now I know why you made it to two-part series here because <laughs> you're like, Chris is not going to shut up. But how how it worked was this. It was... I had no idea that that was a skill set of hers. The more I began to understand why it was an anomaly on my team and learn more about it, I then was able to understand some of the frustrations she has with me mm -hmm. and other yeah. systems or processes or lack of thought in some things. And so it just allowed me to kind of nurture that in there. And when you do that, leaders, when you understand that, when you go at something like that, it does nothing but increase your influence. Um, and that was all under the letter N, the second one that we're at today. <laughs> so if you want influence, yeah. integrity, uh, nurturing, the F stands for faith. Do you believe in people? Mm. Uh, I mm -hmm. often teach, and that, uh, some people scratch their heads when I do this, but every human being has a self-concept. We, How you see yourself, your self-image, your, your self-esteem, your self-belief. And uh, I just believe that uh, how you see yourself determines in part how you perform your role. And I think that leaders can give a great gift to people when they believe. Mm. We start saying, can I help demonstrate my faith in you and that how I, how I see you? And uh, you, can, you can really tell when someone yeah. believes in you, and, the, and you will usually raise your game 
to not disappoint someone if you know they, they think highly of you. Um, but I wondered if you get thinking about how you demonstrate belief in the people on your team. You do this really well, but I wonder if you've captured how you, uh, how you do that. I do that. Well, I think this is such a big thing to me because I had so many people in my life and in my career, and I, I think all of us listening would, would agree with this, that you look back and there are some people that had faith and believed in you more than you believed in yourself. And it really comes across the way you speak to them in one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. and, and how you speak into them. It also, uh, in written communication, goes a long way. And the other thing I think that it does and it goes a long way is when you do it in front of their peers or when you do it in front of the mm -hmm. team. But listen, we've talked about this a couple times already. Man, we want you to be authentic about it. I'm not saying blow smoke and make up something and be so general that the team goes, huh, yeah, like that's just Chris, you know, <laughs> uh, speaking faith in the Perry, even though we're trying to get rid of Perry and he keeps speaking into him, right? Um, but I also want to encourage you that we believe around here that we, it's okay for people to struggle. It's okay. It's okay for people to fail. That means that they're innovating. They're mm -hmm. trying something different. They're, and there's a difference between you know that and then just not showing up for work, right? We're not talking about that. But when that happens and you can see a little bit of discouragement in your team or in your people, that's when you really need to even speak more mm -hmm. of that positive um, and affirm them for their effort not just the results. And here's key. When you do it, this is one of the things that I think are so important to making sure that it's authentic. When you do it, make sure it's specific to things that you see. Meaning, let's just say uh, I was, you, we were in a meeting and, and I was going about speaking my faith and my belief and uh, affirmation in you. It'd be like, man, Perry, that podcast where you talked about influence and you built out this acrostic and whatnot like that was awesome and so then all of a sudden the team's like okay chris is not just over here you know speaking belief and having faith in perry because they like you know they're both level two nature right. and they like to play golf together like he gave us tangible reasons really? and so as specific, leaders yeah. give specific examples and i think when you do that it'll help the faith in that individual but also the faith of the team of why you have the faith in that individual. I think it's huge because I know you and I both played football. Have you ever had a football coach? Mm. I, I had coaches that I take the same mistake or lack of execution on the football field. A, a different coach could say, one coach would say it in a way that why'd you mess that up and really come down on you. And that would affect so good. the way I see myself within, I would then internalize that in a, almost a shameful way yeah. versus the coach that says, uh, Perry, you can do better. Let me show you how you might be able to do that. Then it, it actually elevates by having that belief in me. And so I believe that you believe I'm an idiot, That's then I'm going to act like an idiot. If I believe you believe I can do it, I'm going to raise my game. I, and I thought that. that belief really starts to show up. Uh, finally for today, the, uh, the L in influence. So we had integrity, we had nurturing, and we had faith. The mm. L stands for listening. <laughs> And this is it's probably it's too bad influence doesn't start with an L because this would be the, the first, first thing one. you could That's probably right. do. But um, I doubt you can find a truly influential person right. who is not a good listener. If you're talking about you or talking about other things, you're not listening to the people on your team. It's going to be very hard for you to nurture, have faith uh, to do that. It's probably what I've determined the number one way you can show value to another person is to listen to them. Mm -hmm. So most of us think we're pretty good listeners, but I think we could all improve. What are some practical ways you found you think that we could be working on listening? Yeah, this as the world that we live in, every everyone is busy. There's a lot of chaos going on. There's a lot of noise going on. And I want to encourage us that, you know, we're all in the people business, by the way, <laughs> whether it's your family, which that's where it starts. Uh, community, your organization, there should be nothing more important than the people that we're with, period. Um, and so I think as you begin to look at, okay, well, if I'm going to invest in and be with my people, what do I need to be doing? We need to be listening mm -hmm. and listening intently. I know you talk a lot about curious and being mm -hmm. curious and yeah. the curiosity and like, are you, are you really listening to, to learn? Um, you also talk about, uh, do you want to be uh, interested or do you want to be interesting? Yes. Right. Like that's a that's a that's a a motive part thing that you need to check yourself there. One of the things that I think we could do is ask better questions. You mentioned early on as we were talking about a leader that you have worked with in the past asked you a couple questions. 
But you knew the only reason they were asking the questions, first of all, they're the same questions over and over again. You're like, well, here comes Perry, and he's going to ask me, how was my weekend? You know, what'd you do? Hey, yeah. Let's mix it up a little bit, okay? <laughs> let's make, and then and then not just all, you know, be interested, be curious, and then lead to something that you need. Like, just be interested and curious in the people that we work with. We're not saying you've got to build deep, long-term relationships with everybody you work with, but if you want to increase your influence, you better increase your ability to ask good questions. I would also to encourage you as we talk about this whole listening thing here is, man, remove any distractions. In today's world, we have a lot of distractions, digital distractions, all kinds of stuff going on. And uh, I love some of these restaurants and family members that have these little baskets, right, for Mm -hmm. your phones when you come. And that's the place, like I think about families and think about listening to each other and increasing your influence with each other, right? Like that's the place where stories are told and you hear things you probably would want to hear and and so man how do you how do you remove the distractions and then my last thing is no matter what is going around going on around me and the noise and the distraction like I really try to focus on like there's nothing else going on I don't do this good all the time but when I'm one on one and I'm with an individual I it's like hey this is the most important conversation that I'm in right now and I don't just do that um, as a learned behavior. Well, it's become a learned behavior. I just don't do that to put on a front. Like I have found I've been able to connect better and and listen and ask better questions when I do that. Mm-hmm. And so by doing that, it's increased my influence with those individuals. Yeah, so. I, think, I think about that. Be here now. It's just, Be uh, here now. Uh, That's I, I awesome. Love yeah. I love that. So I, I want you to wrap it up. But just to, okay. I want to encourage our listeners, get the learner guide, get these first four, uh, and then, again, join us next week for the remaining re- remaining five. And I think, for me, these are practical things. Mm. If you could just uh, be practicing each of these nine areas, you will develop your influence. Today's topic is how to become a person of influence part two. Influence is the centerpiece of everything that we do here at Maxwell Leadership. And Barry really went back to a book. Um, I remember this book. It, it was some time ago, yeah. brown and black cover, yeah. Yeah. Jim Dornan's name's yeah. on there, How to Become a Person of Influence. And and so John wrote that book really about, you know, how do you define it? How do you increase your influence? And so uh, in part one last week, Perry broke down the first four letters of influence. We're going to Kind of do an acrostic with the with the word. And I stood for integrity. What does that look like? N stood for nurturing. How do you go about doing that to increase your influence? F is faith, the faith and belief in your people. And then L stood for listening. And we thought we would just end it with listening. Well, because it well, never mind. We're not gonna go there. It doesn't get doesn't get any harder than that for us. So we thought, let us go work on that for a week. So just as a reminder, go back, listen to that take some notes, and then it can blend into what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, let's jump right in. The U, the next letter in the word influence, stands for understanding. And it's really about, are you able to see things from other people's point of view? Um, The key for me here, and I find that people that have a lot of influence with me are others-oriented. They're not self-oriented. It's not mainly about them. It's about others. Uh, We're tempted so much as leaders to focus on maybe not ourselves, but on our business, on what we're trying to accomplish, what I've got most important to me. And it it leads to a a feeling that others may get of your self-centeredness. But when you see things from other people's point of view, uh, you can create, you mentioned this last week, you create more empathy and Mm. compassion. And I think it's a great way to increase influence with others to let them know that you you can you definitely have a point of view, but you you're open to understanding where they're coming from. You're understanding what they're going through. I love this, and and I'm gonna give you just a couple of thoughts, and then I'm gonna put it back to you as we transition to the next letter. Talk about a content piece that you've developed recently that I think helps with this in mm-hmm. some of the organizations and teams that we've been working with. You know, it is tough, and something we need to develop as leaders and as people to see other. See others and, and, and the point of view of where they're coming from and not to take it personally. And the only way to truly understand is to get in there and to truly understand that and to understand how current circumstances and situations, either personally or professionally, are affecting them or the team. And as you do this, I would encourage you um, to have 
communication and conversations more than maybe you're comfortable with. You have to check in frequently to truly understand. And leaders, this is one thing that I would challenge you to do. Don't allow your team to just give you the fluff answers. <laughs> we all give fluff. Hey, how you doing? Oh, man, I'm doing great. It's good to see you. All right. We all know that we all, like my wife says, you got crazy, I got crazy. You don't want my crazy, I don't want your crazy. So we all got some stuff going on. And I know that I, just recently, in the last couple of weeks, I had a team member. I was like, hey, what's going on? How you doing? Oh, I'm doing good. But, I, man, I could just tell. And so there was something there that um, either I wasn't understanding, and maybe they don't want to share, and that's fine. But I couldn't let it rest. I at least wanted to go back one more time. I wanted to check in frequently with my team. I also want to be very aware of the obstacles and challenges that my team may be facing. One of the things that I say, and if you're a sales leader, this is something back in the early on in the sales leadership, I said, no, 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 my job is, yes, I'm going to sell periodically, but my job is to remove obstacles mm -hmm. and to get stuff out of your way, challenges that you're dealing with, so that you can continue to sell. You can continue to connect with your people. Um, you can feel your, your team's energy and your attitude and just be aware of that. I was talking to my son just yesterday and, um, I sent them a text. They're going through some things as a team. And I said, Hey buddy, listen, there's a lot of stuff going on in your brain right now. Things coming up in the next three months and the six months, but you've got to be present and aware mm. of the situation around you with your teammates. And in a situation like that, it allows you to understand where they're at. Now, I say all that to say, one of the greatest pieces I know that, um, well, I speak for myself, that you've developed for us lately and other people is this, is this inclusive leadership. Mm -hmm. And going through that, you know, you develop that and all kinds of threads in that, in that content piece about truly, truly understanding people. Talk a little bit about that before you move on to, mm -hmm. to E, just the connection there with understanding people and the power of inclusively leading people and how that connects. Yeah, I never met a leader, not one, who purposely wanted to exclude or make anybody feel unsafe or unwelcome right. or like they don't belong, but, but we do, uh, or it wouldn't be a thing. We wouldn't have to talk about it. And so what I've learned, and it came mainly from me, was I'm, most, most of us can be very focused on what we're doing, and we don't mean to exclude others, but for me to really – slow down a minute and john talks about this sometimes you have to slow down and yeah. walk among the team walk among the people that i need to really understand where you are i need to understand how you are i need to understand what you're struggling with your comment about obstacles i had people on my team that were that were not producing uh, for uh, and i couldn't figure out why but i was so busy out in front they didn't understand mm. what the expectation was they couldn't do it but they didn't know how to ask and i didn't care enough to look into mm -hmm. it finally uh, you know and it came to a head uh, a little unprofessionally i would say but then i realized if i had just taken the time to understand more where you're coming from and think outside of my own uh, troubles and, and challenges where i am uh, your comments to your son yeah it, it's so tempting where he is right now to be thinking about how it's affecting him but but uh, this is one thing you teach really well and i've seen i know your family so you do this really well is Yes, it's hurting us, but now, but I'm gonna worry about others. Yeah. And so that others orientation opens the door for inclusivity to say, I'm. That's good. Even though I've got something going on, you're important, and I'm gonna show you're important by making you a priority. Yeah. I'm gonna take the time to ask the questions, to be curious, to understand uh, where you are, and maybe I, maybe there is an obstacle I can remove. Maybe there is a barrier. Maybe that I just need to enter into that conversation with empathy and That's compassion so to you, just so we can sit in it together. Yeah. But that tells people something. Too yeah. that you're that you're for me and you're not for yourself. Yeah. And I, I don't for me that was a big picture. Let me before you go on, let me just stop for a second. If what you just heard, leaders, you go, man, I need that in my culture. I need that in my team. That is straight out of Perry's heart and and why he developed inclusive leadership. And it's a it's a course that we have for teams. I, I want you to right now go to maxwellleadership.com slash podcast and fill out a form and say, I want Perry to come and talk to my team about inclusive leadership. And we will do it because it's a powerful content piece to help you at the root of understanding your people. So if it could be at a beach location, then it, right now, be. listen, we're not gonna get specific. <laughs> if it's, you know, if it's North Dakota, we'll, we'll send Rick Vandermeyer, yeah, yeah. <laughs> somebody else like that, but gotcha. Uh, that will go anywhere. Yes, uh, that's right. Moving on the E in influence stands for enlarging. Mm. And that means that I help others become bigger. 
you know, up until now, Chris, you said, oh, integrity, got it. Uh, nurturing, I can do it. Uh, <laughs> faith, I have it. Uh, listening, I'm trying it. Uh, understanding, so <laughs> I'll do it. Man, enlarging, what does that mean? Is that uh, I help people fulfill or find and fulfill their true potential. And I'm helping them grow and develop and then become more. Uh, I know what their career aspirations are. I might even know what their family aspirations are, their goals, their dreams. Uh, I'm helping to navigate the corporate structures. I, I just, uh, I'm looking for ways to make you more. And I think this is one that many leaders have great intentions on, but it just takes a backseat sometimes. Yeah, I love this. Um, and the way to do this is you have to provide feedback to them. I know some of you just took a big old deep breath and you're like, I don't like to give feedback. And this is both positive and constructive feedback. Think back on all the lessons that you and I have learned in our careers and growing up. It came from things that people spoke up to and mm -hmm. said, hey, I, I see this in you, but you could have done this a little bit differently. You should have done this right here. Or next time I want to see the report like this or whatever it might be. And so here's what I want to challenge you with, leaders. As you think about how do I go about enlarging others, first of all, it starts with yourself. You have to enlarge yourself. Mm -hmm. You are responsible for yourself. And so what are you learning? What are you growing? Don't try to keep up with Perry and how many books he's reading or listening to. <laughs> but what you do is then you share what's relevant to where they're at in their professional, personal life with what you're learning. Hey, I, he I heard this nugget the other day, and I'm and I just wanted to pass this along to you. I was reading this mm -hmm. book and I saw that. Like, it just, you're going to give them a thought that's going to enlarge them. You're going to enlarge their scope of potentially going through personal growth, which I think is hugely uh, important. So make sure you're growing yourself because you, you can't give what you don't have. The other thing is, is that I want to encourage you to think about what is it that I'm currently doing as a leader, not to delegate, but to enlarge their responsibility in the organization, mm -hmm. enlarge, their, enlarge their influence, what we're talking about, enlarge their footprint, enlarge their exposure. All of that, remember, is increasing influence. And when you do that, there'll be an opportunity for you to kind of coach them along the way. We use this principle called the 10-80-10 principle. We learned it from John, which is John will come in and he'll say, hey, we have an idea, a thought, an opportunity for the organization or to add value to people, and here's the initial 10%. I want you guys to go run and develop the other 80% of what this could look like and the impact it could have, and then allow us to come back and um, let him speak into that last 10%. I've done that so many times with him over the years that that 80% that he gives us the opportunity to go out and to build and to create and to build up off of his platform, man, that enlarges us. Now, that back 10%, by the way, it's come with some feedback, <laughs> you know, it's a positive and some constructive, yeah. but that is also part of the enlarging others. So just a few ideas around uh, ways for you to practically enlarge your team members. That's good. That's good. Uh, the N, uh, second N we have, this one stands for navigate. Um, are you assisting other through difficulties? And, you know, everybody struggles from time to time, either personally, professionally, uh, it, it, there's a chance for you as a leader the, the key here is that you need to know what they're going through and so if you're not staying close enough to people to understand what they're what they're what's happening you won't be able to help them navigate uh, the tough times that mm -hmm. they that they face um, I know again this is something you do really well you're actually um, you recently staying pretty close to some issues I'm going through with my family and I, I noticed that you've um, there's not a lot you can do about it mm -hmm. actually there's nothing you can do about it, but you have helped me navigate it by simply asking about it, by empathizing, not sympathizing. Mm -hmm. You know, sympathizing says, I'm so sorry you're going through that. Em empathizing says you join me in it mm -hmm. and, and you, you, you allow me to, uh, to express that. Um, uh, you're, you, you offer your own insights and uh, your own experience. Even I had a chance to sit with you and your wife last weekend at the mm. national championship. Did we mention that national yeah. championship? Whoa, yeah. Whoa, whoa. yeah. Um, we were in ra rainy <laughs> San Diego, Southern California. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but even the insights were shared there that were very helpful to me. So, you know, asking if there's anything that I need the, there's ways you, we do this as leaders that just say that I'm going to help you navigate whatever the difficulties you're going yeah. through. I think uh, John in the 21 laws, the law of navigation, 
I think as leaders, we all have an incredible mindset and idea and strategy of navigating kind of where we want our department to go, our team, our business. What we're talking about here is yes, that, but also really we're talking about influence with people and, and it does start with, with knowing, right? So how could, how could we have a conversation last week where my wife who happens to be knowledgeable in certain areas and we're dealing with some things in our family that could say, Hey, this is what we've learned. The only way we could have ever had that conversation and navigate some things that may have helped you or you could help us is that the fact that we know that right. about each right. other. And so it does start absolutely with the knowing. The other thing is leaders, you don't need to have all the answers. Sometimes it's okay to just sit in it with people. Mm -hmm. And as you sit in it, as you made a statement to be with, then you maybe then something's going to come up and say, Hey, what about this? Maybe you could make a right turn here. I know I did this one time. And whereas from the beginning, you look at it from the outside and you go, man, there's no way that I could help or navigate or give any type of influence or input there, but don't give up on it. Just go in and, and kind of sit with them and you don't have to have all, all of the answers. The other thing is, is that oftentimes when you become a sounding board or when people uh, want you to jump in with them and help them navigate something, either way, whether it's a physical or it's an emotional trait of this navigation, um, it's so important for you to tr truly kind of know what's going on. And so as you think about helping people navigate, it starts with knowing. And to your point, the only way to, to really know is to begin to think about some of these others that we talked about with asking questions and being empathetic and whatnot. But, but definitely make sure to increase your influence that you help those that are in your inner circle navigate certain things in their life. Well, actually, it's one of the of these uh, nine things. It's one of the you can kind of test: Do I have any influence? Yeah. Uh, you can say, "How am I doing?" Is <laughs> yeah. that uh, people aren't looking for me to navigate or help? Yeah. They don't look to me to help them navigate. Then maybe you don't have any influence. Right. And so it's, you go back to the to the others. The C stands for connecting. This is where you initiate positive relationships, and uh, the key word here is initiate that. Uh, if you hope to have influence with others, you really can't sit around waiting for them to come to you. You you initiate uh, the connection with them. Um, connection to me is about finding common ground. Mm -hmm. It's about taking the time to connect and learn uh, about people, what they value, what what motivates them. Um, you know, if I know what what you value and I know what motivates you, I can add value to your life. Um, by meeting you where you are. And this uh, takes me to initiate, though, but this whole idea about connecting is a huge piece of level two yeah. in the five levels. But give me your thoughts on connecting. Yeah, another 21 laws that John created, the law of connection. Um, I love that you tied it to level two because uh, we often talk about level two being about relationships. It's really even a little bit deeper than that. It's about connections. And when you connect with people, it looks all kinds of different ways. Right, like it doesn't just have to be. Hey, how was your weekend? Adversity connects. We talk about this. Going through things together as a team, mm -hmm. as an individual, as a fa family, is going to connect you. Bringing people in just to go through a project, maybe just to sit in on a meeting, not say a word, not have any input, and then afterwards say, "Hey, what'd you think about that meeting? Is there anything you learned? Anything I should share with the team that you weren't aware of?" Like things like that. When you begin to create. Take them, take them with you on some lunch meetings you may have. Let them sit in on, on a call. There are all kinds of ways to do that. When you do that, um, you absolutely are touching that leader in a, it, their heart first, right? Because you're including them, you're connecting with them before you're even asking for anything for them to do for the organization. We talk about discretionary effort a mm -hmm. lot. That's a phrase we use mm -hmm. around here at Level 2. When you understand the power of connecting with people, um, and truly knowing them and caring for them, that you're not trying to manipulate them, you're not trying to just get them to give you an answer or do a project because it benefits you, but because it benefits the collective, there's all kinds of ways to do that. So open your mind as you think about how can I increase my influence by connecting with people. We just gave you a couple of ways to be able to do that. Good, really good. Uh, finally, the last letter is E, and it stands for empowering, hmm. and it really is about giving power to those you lead. I love, I'll just go back to the 21 laws again. John, uh, I love the way he phrased the law of empowerment says that secure leaders give power to others. Mm. And it, uh, the question I ask in coaching a lot is, do you want to see things work 
without you or do you want to see things work because of you? Mm. And, you know, the insecure leader will have trouble letting go of their power and doing things necessary to see it work without them. Um, but a secure leader wants others to 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 lead, to, to, to be empowered, to be able to make decisions, to run the business. And that they don't, the leader, they don't have to be present for the success of the what's That's happening right. around there. So I love this uh, empowerment. How do you see that one? Yeah, I will um, I'll tackle this um, and then throw it back to you and and I'll I'll wrap this up and you can close out on the podcast. But as I think about this, man, we talk about the five levels of leadership early on. This is a perfect fit for level 4. Mm. We talk about the fact that we want to we want to influence people by developing them personally and professionally. And when you empower people, man, so so many leaders um, get this confused or do it the wrong way or don't even know how to do it, right? Like yeah. they walk in and they go, hey, Chris, um, man, go go run the sales team today. You're empowered. <laughs> and then two weeks later, Chris, we're giving you your separation notice as a sales leader, right? Because they – they come in and they just delegate it. They don't develop or empower. Actually, they dump that. it. They don't delegate. There you go. I love that. They love that where they just kind of dump it on you. Um, and so you you need to go about it a little bit differently. You got to have a process in place. Um, we we talk about as kind of modeling, equipping, and developing. Mm. You know, as a leader, are you modeling it first? And and what does that look like? Because that's that's contagious. Uh, are you equipping them? Are you resourcing them? Are you when you do that? You're empowering them. Are you developing them? Are you speaking into what it looks like the first ten percent, and then maybe check ins along the way, so that people go, "Man, he's I, I feel empowered to to do this and 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 to lead this project or this assignment or whatever it might be." And by doing that, you will increase your influence, um, and what we call will will be at level four influence. And I love your statement. You said. You know, is it happening? Would you prefer to see it happen without you or because of you? Mm -hmm. Like that's a man. I challenge leaders to write that statement down and then really think about where you are at in regards to that statement. Well, as we wrap up, I said this the last session in our podcast, and I'll say it again. Man, make sure your motive is pure mm -hmm. in regards to why you are trying to increase your influence. Everyone, as we talk about at Maxwell Leadership. Everyone deserves to be led well. And in order for you to have powerful, positive change with people and with teams and your family and your organization, you got to have the right motive around influence. And so as we wrap up, the last five that we talked about today that you laid out for us was um, the U stood for understanding. Make sure, we under make sure we understand other people. See it from their point of view. Lead inclusively. Uh, the E was for enlarging. How do we help others become bigger than they already are? N was for navigating. How do you help and assist others through some of their difficulties? C, how do you connect with people? How do you initiate that connection to increase your positive relationship with them? And then finally, E was for empowering. And how do we do that the proper way? <laughs> Not just, as you said, dump it on them. How do we empower them to lead? And when you do that, your inc your influence will increase. It's a great opportunity for you to increase your influence, but also you should be teaching this to the people on your team. Everyone's a leader because leadership is influence. They don't have to have a title to be a leader. They're, they're leading where they are. If they're not, then they're probably stuck in the old paradigm of leadership as a title. Um, everybody can lead from wherever they are in the organization, but these nine things I think will help not only you, but it's something you could be teaching. As Chris said, do a week by week, go through how are we developing our, our influence in these areas. Welcome to the Maxwell Leadership Executive Podcast, where our goal is to help you increase your reputation as a leader, increase your ability to influence others, and increase your ability to fully engage your team to deliver remarkable results.